Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number seven, ready for teaching on May 13. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. This lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and is titled Worshipping the Creator. Sabbath afternoon, May 6. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today, wherever we're listening around the world whether it be on any of the great continents or on any of the small or large islands of the sea, whether it be in the desert or on the mountains or on the plains, we just thank you that you created this world, that you created the opportunity for us to actually exist, and that because of your creation and because of the results of sin, We have the opportunity of being saved through the death of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the forethought, and we also thank you for the thought for for us as well. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and bless us. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Sydney, Australia, or Hamilton, New Zealand, or I'd like to pray for Mkenya Harisi in Kenya, and Mary Lou in Alabama, and Edward in Garoka, and Rowan Hoper in Rosedale, and Charlotte in Jamaica, and Amado in San Francisco, and Numbeko in Port Elizabeth, and Caro in Palatino in Argentina, and Viola in Curacao, and Anita Santos in Belize, and for my friends, the Wiggles family in South Africa. Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that you will bless us today, that where there is hurt, where there is pain, where there is illness, that you will be there to bless and to guide. Open our eyes that we may see, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Let's read that again, Revelation 4 and verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. It's easy to take things for granted, particularly things that we have always known or experienced. How easy it is, for instance, for young children to take their parents for granted, whom they've known all their short lives. How easy for us, too, to take for granted the sun, the sky, the air or the ground beneath our feet. However, have you ever stopped to think about how much we take existence itself for granted? That is, how often do we stop and ask the famous philosophical question, why is there something instead of nothing? Why does our universe itself and all the majesty and grandeur and astonishing things in it exist to begin with? What great logical contradiction would occur were our universe and we who are in it not here? According to the latest scientific theory, they tend to change, our universe once did not exist. In other words, ours is a contingent existence, and it's a miracle that we are here at all. And despite all sorts of myths about the universe arising from absolutely nothing, or from some kind of mathematical equation, our universe exists because God, the Creator, has made it and everything in it. Sunday, May 7, A Companion in Tribulation After his ascension to heaven, as recorded in Acts chapter 1 verse 9, Jesus visited the last of the living apostles, John, on the island of Patmos, where John had been exiled by the ruthless Roman emperor Domitian. Let's read uh, Acts 1 verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Read Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. See also Matthew 13.21, Acts 14.22, and John 16.33. 
What's the message here for all who seek to follow Jesus in this world? Revelation 1 and verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Matthew 13, verse 21, Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And Acts 14, verse 22, Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And John 16, verse 13, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Separated from the support of his family, friends and the Christian community, John was not left alone in the tribulations and trouble that he faced as a follower of Jesus. His ministry was not over. His witness was not complete. An angelic visitor of dazzling brightness visited John on that lonely isle and brought him a message directly from the throne of God. This message from Jesus was to echo down the corridors of time through the centuries. It was a message of hope for every generation, but especially a message to prepare God's last day people for the coming of Jesus. It is a serious message of warning as well as an end-time message of encouragement as we get ready to face the trials of the final days, or any trials that you might be facing now. If you were to enter the cave where it is purported that John was visited by the heavenly angel with Revelation's prophetic vision, you would immediately notice these words placed on a plaque at its entrance, summarising the entire book of Revelation. It's actually Revelation chapter 14 verse 7. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The central issue of the book of Revelation is worship. We were created as worshipping beings. Every one of us worships something or someone. True worship, the worship of the Creator, enables us to discover life's true purpose. It gives us a reason for living. It gives us not only something to die for, but also, even more significantly, something to live for and, if need be, to endure tribulations for. And indeed, as the final crises arise, we will better understand that, as it says in Acts 14 verse 22, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So to finish the day, if faithful servants of God, like John, face tribulation and suffering, what makes us think we ourselves won't face trouble either? And let's have a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 15. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified." But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Monday, May 8. Worship the Creator. Read Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. How does the message of the first angel conclude? What final appeal does this judgment hour message make? And also see Isaiah 40, verse 26, John 1, 1 to 3, and Romans 1, verse 20. Let's begin with Revelation 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, 
the sea and springs of water. And Isaiah 40, verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. And John 1, verses 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And Romans 1 verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Revelation 14.7 ends with a clarion call to worship the Creator. This call is especially important now when most of the scientific and even the Christian world have accepted evolution, a teaching that strikes at the very heart of all things biblical and Christian. If evolution were true, our faith would, of necessity, be a lie. That's how stark the issues are. Revelation's final appeal, then, is rooted in the Bible's first book, Genesis. We will never fully understand the issues in this cosmic battle over worship unless we understand the significance of creation. As it said in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This verse is the foundation for all of Scripture. In the beginning God created. The Hebrew word for create is in this passage is bara, B-A-R-A, a a verb that is used only and exclusively with God himself as the subject. In the beginning, God created. To get just a little idea of how unlimited God's power is, let's consider just one object of his creation, the sun. The sun produces more energy in one second than humanity has produced by oil, gas, coal or fire since the beginning of time. The sun has a diameter of approximately 865,000 miles. And if we put that in kilometres, that goes well over a million kilometres and would hold one million planets the size of Earth. But the sun is just one of at least 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. One star, called the Pistol Star, gives off as much as 10 million times the power generated by our sun. One million stars the size of our sun can easily fit within the sphere of the Pistol Star. How do we even begin to wrap our minds around the creation? Creation reveals a God of awesome might and unlimited power. His creative power not only brought the heavens and earth into existence, but also has worked in behalf of his people through the centuries. He is the God who began this world, who is ever-present in this world, and who will never forsake his people in this world. And so to finish today, despite how small we are in contrast to the creation, Christ died for us. How does the overwhelming size of the creation only amplify the reality of God's love? Tuesday, May 9. A God who is close. The God of creation who brought the sun, moon and stars into existence, whose awesome power created this planet and filled it with living beings, also is a God who is interested in each one of us. He is the God who delivered his people from Egyptian bondage, who guided them in their wilderness wanderings, who rained manna out of heaven, who caused the walls of Jericho to collapse, and who defeated Israel's enemies. The same God who unleashed his infinite power to create the universe unleashes that infinite power to defeat the forces of evil that wage the battles for our souls. Read 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Psalm 139 15 to 18 and Acts 17 27 and of course Colossians 1 verse 17. What do these verses teach us about the closeness of God? 
First of all, 2 Corinthians 2.15 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Psalm 139, beginning at verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And Acts 17.27 So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Colossians 1 verse 17 And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Theologians talk about the transcendence of God. That is, the idea that God exists above and over all of the creation. But they also talk about the imminence of God. This is the idea that God also somehow exists within our world and, as biblical history shows, is intricately and intimately involved in it. Though the Lord dwells in a high and holy place, he also is with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, as it says in Isaiah 57.15. As Jesus himself said, talking about his faithful followers in John 17.23, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. It doesn't get closer or more intimate than that. The great news about our God is that his greatness and power are so vast that it reaches across the cosmos and into each of our lives. He promises to remake us, mould us and transform us into the likeness of his image. Think about what that means. The God who created and sustains billions of galaxies is the same God, not only in whom we live and move and have our being, as it said in Acts 17.28, but also who works in us to give us new hearts, to purge us from sin, and to make us into new creatures in Christ. What a powerfully comforting thought to realise our God, a God of such power, loves and cares for us. And so to finish the day, How can we learn to draw hope and comfort from understanding the imminence of God? Or does it scare you because God knows your darkest secrets? How should the gospel give you peace in that context? Wednesday, May 10. Gospel, Judgment, Creation Look at the first angel's message. Everlasting Gospel, Hour of Judgment, Worship the Creator. Look at how closely related these ideas are. When we stand before our Creator in judgment, it's only the Gospel that gives us any hope at all, as we read in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. No condemnation now and certainly not in the judgment. The message of God as creator is so central to present truth, especially when evolution, even when dressed up in Christian garb, threatens to destroy the entire foundation of the Christian faith. Yet, amid the onslaught of evolutionary thought, God has raised up a church, a people whose very name itself is a witness against the idea of evolution, a people who are to proclaim the foundational truth of God as our Creator and Redeemer. Read Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9, Colossians 1, 13 to 17, Revelation 4, 11, and Romans 5, 17 to 29. What do these texts teach about Jesus as Creator and Redeemer? 
Firstly, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And Colossians 1, beginning at verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And Revelation 4 verse 11, You are worthy, O God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And Romans 5, beginning at verse 17, For if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offence judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Look at how closely tied Jesus as Creator is to the Jesus as Redeemer. The moment that his role as Creator is diminished, as the theory of evolution inevitably does, his role as our Redeemer comes into question as well. Jesus comes to redeem us from sin, from death, from suffering and from violence. When sin, death, suffering and violence are, as evolution teaches, the very means of creation itself. God redeems us from the very process he used to create us to begin with. It's a dangerous lie. And what makes it even worse is that evolution mocks the very idea of Jesus' death on the cross. Why? Paul, as we saw in Romans 5, 17-19, inseparably links the introduction of sin by Adam to the death of Jesus. There's a direct link, then, between Adam and Jesus. In any evolutionary model, however, no sinless Adam could have introduced death because death, millions of years of death, was supposedly the force and power that was needed to create Adam to begin with. Hence, right from the start, evolution destroys the biblical foundation of the cross. In contrast, Seventh-day Adventists, by calling the world to worship the Creator, stand as a living witness against this error. Thursday, May 11, The Creator on the Cross However much we can and do marvel and worship the Lord as our Creator, there's more to it. As we have already seen, but worth looking at again, is the idea that our Creator also is our Redeemer. The God who created us is the same God who redeemed us. The God who said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, in Genesis 1.26, is the same one who on the cross cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, in Matthew 27.46. Talk about the reason to fear God, even more so, to give glory to him and to worship him as well. How can we as fallen human beings adequately respond to such an amazing truth as this? What could we possibly do in response? We are told in the first angel's message what to do in Revelation 14.7 Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. 
Read John chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, John's account of Jesus on the cross. As you read it, think of the Bible text that we have looked at about Jesus as Creator, as the one by whom all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, Colossians 1.16. How are we to respond to this amazing expression of God's love? Well, John chapter 19, beginning at verse 16, Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the centre. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but... He said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The first angel's message to worship the Creator came after the cross, after it had become known to the onlooking universe and to Christ's followers that the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water, is the same one who, though being God, took the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, as you read in Philippians 2, verses 7 and 8. What an amazing spectacle that must have been to those who knew Jesus before he came to earth as a human being. No wonder heavenly beings worship him as well. As for us, redeemed by his blood, what else could we do but worship our Creator and our Redeemer? And so to finish today, why is the idea, in light of the cross, of fallen human beings being able to add anything to what Christ did on the cross, such a heretical idea? Which of our works could add to what the Creator already has done for us? Friday, May 12. The worship of God is central to the scriptures and has always been a bone of contention for humans and for God's people. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets reprimanded the people of God for worshipping other gods or for worshipping the Lord using the worship practices of the pagan world. The conflict between Worshipping God and worshipping other gods belongs at the very centre of the cosmic conflict and comes accompanied by conflict over disregard for the law of God. 
And now we have a quote from an unpublished manuscript, page 42, titled The Closing of the Cosmic Conflict, Role of the Three Angels' Messages by Angel Manuel Rodriguez. It reads, Worship addresses the most fundamental aspect of human existence in that it has to do with what humans as living creatures should do when confronted by the presence of the Creator. Only those who are alive can worship the Lord. The dead cannot praise and worship Him. The one who created us invites us to surrender our lives in the act of worship in order to receive them back from Him enriched to be used for the benefit of others. Worship has to do with the very nature and purpose of our existence and with the need for having a centre outside of ourselves that frees us from selfishness. Not to worship God is to lose our reason for existence. It is to exist in a state of disorientation and therefore be dying, heading to total extinction because we are disconnected from the very source of life. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, dwell more on this idea of why, in a fallen world, being created by God is not enough. Why do we need the promise of redemption as well? And two, think about some experience in which you unmistakably saw the power of God work in your life, that is, in a way that showed you God's love for you personally. And then dwell on the fact that this is God who created the entire cosmos. And this God loves you enough to care about your life. Why should this reality not only be comforting, but also humbling? And three, if evolution were true, think about how we would be called to worship a creator who used billions of years of death violence, destruction, suffering and mass extinction in order to create us, while at the same time giving us a completely different story in Genesis about how we were created. And yet we are supposed to be worshipping him. Worship him for what? For lying to us for thousands of years about how we got here to begin with? And here's Sibylla with Inside Story. Thank you, Sibylla. Sobered by God's Grace by Dale Walcott Back in the 1970s, two sets of Navajo parents, unknown to each other, sent their teenagers to live in the dormitories at Holbrook Seventh-day Adventist Indian School, located 100 miles, approximately 160 kilometres, away from home. At Holbrook, boy met girl, Boy and girl both met Jesus, and they were baptised. In due time, there was a wedding, the first to be held in the newly constructed Seventh-day Adventist Church in the boys' hometown of Shinlay, Arizona. When Dennis and Gloria Fulton's first baby arrived, they took him with them to church. So, baby Oliver grew up knowing that the Adventist Church was his church. But somehow, he never really met Jesus. Things got in the way such as Gloria's nursing job at the local hospital. Making matters worse, Dennis struggled with alcohol and Oliver began drinking as a teen. Oliver graduated from public high school, moved to the big city to earn a master's degree in information technology and discovered that alcohol was controlling his life. At 38, Oliver, in desperation, moved back home to Shinlay, where he knew his mother had been praying for him. He started attending his childhood church, hoping that something would change for him. Oliver found that the church ran an addiction recovery ministry in which 18 Avagio people with struggles, like his own, met in the church fellowship hall five evenings a week for Jesus and Me, a program modelled on Alcoholics Anonymous. His life began to change. Meanwhile, the church pastor noticed Oliver in the congregation one Sabbath and suggested having lunch the next week. The meal filled Oliver with hope. When I came home, I figured I was such a bad sinner that I could never go to heaven, Oliver says. I just thought that maybe if I sobered up, I could help some other people to get to heaven. But at lunch that day, the pastor told me that my sins could actually be forgiven. Jesus would accept me just as I am. I was amazed. It gave me hope. Oliver has been sober for four years now. 
At the church, Oliver met a woman, Tracy, with her own story of Jesus delivering her from her heroin and addiction. The pastor baptised Oliver just days before marrying him and Tracy in the same church where his parents had been married about 40 years earlier. Today, Oliver leads the Chanel Church's recovery ministry. He also is taking online classes to become a certified substance abuse counsellor. Incidentally, Oliver's father has been sober for several years as well. Sometimes on Sabbaths, father and son sit together in church. Their sweethearts at their sides and smiles in their hearts. Thank you for your mission offerings that support Seventh-day Adventist education and other forms of mission outreach around the world. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.